My father has had diabetes for 30 years and just recently in the last two months, he lost his right leg because of diabetes. And that was a disaster to the family. So I decided to start a series of webinars on how I treat diabetes. And with the help of my friends, we will discuss diabetes management uh, as it is in uh, Iran and in the US and all, the, all around the world. My name is Amir Anushiravani. I'm an assistant professor of gastroenterology and hepatology at Tehran University of Medical Sciences. And it is a great pleasure and honor to have two of my best friends, colleagues, and two expert endocrinologists. Uh, let me introduce Dr. Neku Panahi. She is an assistant professor of endocrinology and metabolism here at Tehran University of Medical Sciences. She also has an MPH, a PhD. And uh, my best friend, Reza Pishtad, he's an endocrinologist. He's currently at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. And in a couple of months, he will be moving to Harvard University and he will be an assistant professor of endocrinology and metabolism at Massachusetts General Hospital. So thank you both for joining me today. Let's start with Dr. Neku Panahi. She will be starting on discussing diabetes management and the recent advances that we have in the management of diabetic patients. Dr. Neku Panahi, please. Thank you, Dr. Anushiravani, and uh, uh, I'm going to uh, start my presentation uh, in the ad recent advances in the management of diabetes. Uh, I'd like to ask if uh, my slides are shared properly. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Person-centered glycemic management uh, cycle is shown here. Uh, optimal management of diabetes uh, requires a systematic approach and involvement of a coordinated team of healthcare professionals. The goals of management of diabetes is to prevent complications and to optimize the quality of life. And persons with diabetes should have active role in their management. Uh, the management plan should be individualized based on the person characteristics, including age, their school or work conditions, and their current state of diabetes, and other factors impacting treatment choice include whether cardiorenal protection is uh, our goal or not, and financial issues should be uh, addressed as well. Then uh, via shared decision making, a management plan uh, should be created. Uh, here, language and appropriate language using is uh, very important. Uh, the plan should be agreed upon uh, by both healthcare professional and the patient with diabetes and should be measurable, achievable, realistic, and then implemented uh, and ongoing monitoring support is required. And in uh, regular inter uh, intervals, uh, if uh, modifications are needed, mutual agreement on uh, modification should be uh, performed and uh, this cycle should be repeated at least once or twice yearly um, to avoid therapeutic inertia. Uh, since the persons with diabetes should have active role in their management plan, uh, it is important to use languages that is not neutral, non-judgmental, based on facts and physiology, free from a stigma, strength-based and person-centered. Uh, for example, instead of saying the person is non-compliant, uh, we should say for, uh, he is taking his medication half the time whenever she can afford it. Or uh, sulfonyl ura um, is used by the person, but it is not enough to lower her blood glucose instead of saying the diabetes, diabetes is not controlled. And instead of saying a diabetic patient, we should say, for example, a person with diabetes, or we do not have something like diabetic foot. We have a person who has ulcer in his feet. And uh, to start a management, we should evaluate disease-related complications and their comorbidities uh, through routine eye exam, food exam, and assessment of uh, urinary uh, albumin um, to creatinine ratio. And if elevated, it should be repeated uh, two to three times over a period of three to six months to avoid false positive results. Uh, the rationale for this assessment is that we have effective medications to prevent uh, progressive kidney damage, like AC inhibitors and SGLT2 inhibitors. 
to screen coronary heart disease, we should identify risk factors like a smoking, uh, weight, diet, sedentary lifestyle. Uh, it is not routine to perform exercise stress testing in all asymptomatic patients because it has not proved uh, to improve outcomes beyond medical management of risk factors. And those sedentary adults who want to uh, begin exercise, they should initiate with gentle exercise and increase the intensity as tolerated gradually. Um, it is for um, the patients using insulin or other uh, medications that may cause hypoglycemia, uh, they should uh, at least periodically self-monitor their blood glucose. However, it is not necessary in those on diet alone or the, on those uh, who receive um, the medication that does not cause hypoglycemia. A1C goals should be individualized based on benefits of tight uh, glucose um, control uh, to prevent microvascular complications and the risks of hypoglycemia. Uh, a reasonable value accepted is A1C levels of less than 7%. However, uh, in those who have high risk of hypoglycemia, those with long standing disease duration, short life expectancy, and who already have severe important comorbidities and vascular complications, and in less motivated patients uh, with limited access to resource and support system, we are less stringent and A1C uh, more than seven would be accepted as well. Uh, and those using continuous glucose monitoring, the reasonable timing range is uh, more than 70% and time below range of less than uh, 4%. For old and frail individuals, uh, we are less stringent and more than uh, greater than 50% timing range and less than 1% time below range is accepted. Health information technology, especially telemedicine or telehealth, uh, have proven to be useful in reducing hemoglobin A1c when used complementary to in-person visits to optimize glycemic management in people with uh, diabetes that is uh, not good managed or uh, in medically underserved patients. Uh, because it uh, provides easy access and uh, especially in rural areas with limited healthcare, healthcare resources. Uh, you can observe here that, uh, that uh, telemedicine, uh, different strategies of telemedicine, especially teleconsultation, uh, uh, are, um, have beneficial effect in hemoglobin A1C and uh, motivational interview-based telehealth uh, is uh, beneficial in improving A1C, self-efficacy and systolic blood pressure in most of the studies. Uh, financial issues uh, have influences in prescribing patterns and medication use. And uh, we should know that um, most effective approved medication with cardiorenal and weight benefit effects uh, are not covered by insurances and uh, this imposes burden on patients and is a major source of health disparities among patients with diabetes. Uh, and uh, therefore cost should be a focus of treatment goals. One quarter of patients have reported cost related insulin underuse. And it is important to notice that more than one third of them did not discuss this with their clinician. It emphasizes the need to seek actively for their financial problems. Two thirds also had difficulty affording diabetes equipment. Uh, diabetes technology is a term used to refer to hardware, devices, and software used by uh, persons with type 2, uh, type 1 diabetes or type 2 diabetes. Uh, to assist with their self-management of life to do in different dimensions, uh, including lifestyle modification, glucose monitoring, and therapy adjustments. Uh, they were uh, historically divided into insulin as administered by syringe, pen, or pump, or glucose as assessed by blood glucose monitoring or continuous glucose monitoring. However, with the advance in diabetes technology, it now includes automated insulin delivery systems in which CGM informed algorithms modulate insulin delivery and diabetes self-management support software uh, are used as clinical devices. Technology, when coupled with education, follow-up, and support, can improve the lives and quality of life of persons with diabetes. However, the complexity and rapid evolution of diabetes technology can be a barrier to its implementation by both healthcare professionals and their patients. 
there is no one size fits so all approach to technology use, and uh, the type and selection of the device should be individualized based on the specific needs, preferences, and the skill level of either the person with diabetes or his or her caregiver. Uh, when prescribed these devices, um, the persons using these devices should receive initial and ongoing education and training either in person or remotely. And ongoing evaluation is mandatory to assess the technique, the results, whether the person is able to utilize data properly, including uploading or sharing data, and to monitor and adjust therapy. Continuous glucose monitoring, continuous subcutaneous insulin infusion, and automated insulin delivery devices can be beneficial depending on needs and preferences of the person with diabetes or the caregiver. Uh, those uh, using these devices should have continued access across third party players, regardless of their age or hemoglobin A1C levels, and uh, students using these devices should be supported at a school. There are challenges in using diabetes technology. First of them is their availability, and even if available, insurance coverage can lag behind device availability. And uh, in one hand, uh, we are, there are issues with patient interest in devices and willingness for adoption. And in the other hand, uh, there are challenges uh, in healthcare teams to keep up with newly released technology, which usually ha um, happen very rapidly. Uh, among the devices mentioned, uh, the most commonly used in Iran is uh, blood glucose monitoring by glucometers. And uh, blood glucose monitoring is an integral component of effective therapy and persons using insulin. And they should check uh, glucose when appropriate based on and their insulin therapy and the frequency and timing is based on a specific needs and goals. They may uh, need to uh, assess their blood glucose when fasting, prior to meals, after meals, at bedtime, when they suspect hypo or hyperglycemia, after treating hypoglycemia until normal glycemia is achieved and prior to exercise and critical tasks, and even while critical tasks such as driving uh, is performed. Even those using continuous glucose monitoring should uh, have access to blood glucose monitoring at all times and to use it when they suspect the accuracy of their device, when they are waiting for warm up and uh, calibration, when they receive warning messages, and when rapid change in glucose level is detected. Uh, for the patients on non-insulin therapies, especially those uh, using agents that do not cause hypoglycemia, it is not uh, necessary to use blood glucose monitoring. However, when used, uh, they can help altering nutrition plan, physical activity, and or changing the dose or frequency of medication. Uh, the healthcare professional should be aware of the differences in the accuracy of devices, and I should uh, recommend uh, the persons to um, use uh, the, only the approved devices and use only unopened, unexpired test strips purchased from pharmacies. And uh, they should know that some agents and medication can um, affect and influence on the results like high dose vitamin C or hypoxemia. Uh, here uh, in this chart, uh, you can observe that the, that the greater the frequency of blood glucose monitoring is associated with the lower hemoglobin A1C levels at all age groups and in both insulin pump users and injection insulin users. And however, many persons report taking no action when results are high or low. Uh, and uh, presently, some meters provide real-time advice to the users. To optimize the device use, uh, persons with diabetes using blood glucose monitoring should receive education on how to use the data to adjust food intake, physical activity, or pharmacology therapy. Here you can observe a sample of um, uh, ambulatory glucose profile reports from a continuous glucose monitoring uh, during a period of 14 days. It uh, provides us with data on time in range, time below range, and time above range. Uh, and here it is a summary of glucose values uh, with median and other percentiles shown. And this is a daily profile of the 14 days period reported. Uh, Dr. Pishtad will uh, tell us more about how to use the data and how to manage treatment with these uh, devices. Uh, adults with type 1 diabetes uh, usually should receive multiple daily injection of prandial and basal insulin or continuous subcutaneous insulin infusion. Rapid acting insulin are uh, superior to regular insulin, which is short acting. Uh, 
because they reduce the hypoglycemia risk. And uh, probably long-acting insulins like uh, galargine and detemir are superior to NPH intermediate insulin. Uh, persons with type 1 diabetes should receive education on how to match mealtime insulin doses to carbohydrate intake, fat and protein content, and anticipated physical activity. Here are different uh, insulin regimens in patients with type 1 diabetes. Uh, more and more individuals now are interested uh, to receive continuous insulin infusion regimens, which have started with insulin pump without automation, to the one uh, which can predict low glucose and suspend insulin release, and uh, ultimately hybrid closed loop technology, which is the most flexible with the lowest risk of hypoglycemia, however, with the highest cost and less availability. In Iran, uh, people with uh, type 1 diabetes usually receive injected insulin regimens. The, the most preferred one is a multiple daily injection with long acting and rapid acting, which is more flexible and uh, lower, have a lower risk of hypoglycemia compared to, uh, to other multiple daily injections with either MPH and rapid acting or MPH and regular. Uh, the less um, preferable um, approach is using twice daily MPH and regular, which is not recommended. Uh, here it is an algorithm uh, set by American Diabetes Association in uh, 2023 for pharmacologic management of type 2 diabetes. You can see that there are many medications and uh, we should choose uh, which medication uh, uh, by considering the person characteristics, the medication characteristics, and our goal of therapy, whether it is to have cardiorenal protection uh, or uh, whether we want to manage weight or only um, management of hyperglycemia is um, considered. Uh, these are different classes of antidiabetic medications. Uh, they differ to each other regarding their cardiorenal effects, their effects on weight management, whether they reduce or increase the weight, uh, whether they uh, can cause hypoglycemia or not, and uh, their efficacy and cost differ as well. Uh, SGLT2 inhibitors uh, can um, Pre, uh, inhibit uh, glucose reabsorption in the renal proximal tubule. And uh, besides this anticholistemic um, effect, they can uh, have beneficial effects on cardiac and uh, renal tissue. Uh, mainly, uh, the mechanism is to reduce the cardiorenal risk factors uh, and uh, reducing payload or afterload and reducing uh, the inflammation and having antifibrotic effect. Uh, this network meta-analysis is a simplified, uh, uh, here you can uh, observe a simplified um, uh, finding of the network meta-analysis um, that compared uh, different medication regarding cardiorenal outcomes, and you can observe that uh, DPP-4 inhibitors are uh, similar to placebo in all of the cardiorenal outcomes, and uh, for almost all of them, SGLT2 inhibitors and GLP-1 receptor agonists are superior, and uh, regarding uh, hospitalization for heart failure and improving renal outcomes, SGLT2 inhibitors are uh, even superior to GLP-1 receptor agonist. Uh, these findings and uh, evidence uh, has now integrated into the guidelines and we can use uh, this information to choose what uh, medication to uh, prescribe for the patient with diabetes. Here are the available SGLT2 inhibitors and uh, GLP-1 receptor agonists in Iran and pagliflozin either uh, alone or in combination with metformin or linagliptin uh, in these brand names is available. And uh, GLP-1 receptor agonist, uh, liraglutide is uh, available in Iran in the brand name of Victoza and uh, melitide. So if our goal is to reduce the cardiorenal risk in addition to comprehensive cardiovascular risk management, independent of the background metformin use, uh, we should choose uh, the medication with proven cardiorenal protective effect. For those with atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease as defined by established cardiovascular disease, MI, stroke, prevascularization of any type, and in some studies, even transient ischemic attack on stable angina, 
uh, amputation or coronary artery disease, and those at high risk, uh, which may include uh, those more than 55 years with two or more risk factors of obesity, hypertension, smoking, dyslipidemia, and albuminuria should receive either GLP-1 receptor agonist or SGLT2 inhibitors. Persons with diabetes who have heart failure, either reduced or preserved ejection fraction, uh, SGLT2 inhibitors are preferred. And in those with CKD, uh, defined as GFR less than 60 or albumin creatinine ratio greater than three, SGLT2 inhibitors are preferred and should be initiated if GFR is more than 20. And once initiated, it should be continued until hemodialysis or transplant. If not tolerated or contraindicated, the next step and our next choice is GLP-1 receptor agonist. If needed, we can add the other class of medication as well. If our goal is not cardiorenal protection for uh, those who are not uh, classified in the mentioned groups, uh, we should uh, see whether weight management is our goal or not. If uh, weight reduction is our goal, uh, we can use the findings of this network meta-analysis, which has uh, compared to any anti-diabetic medication in more than 400 trials uh, regarding their effect in body weight. And, uh, it found that uh, semaglutide is superior to all other medications. And after that, uh, other GLP-1 receptor agonists, and you can see empagliflozin and other SGLT2 inhibitors, which are uh, effective in reducing weight. And then we come to metformin and DPP-4 inhibitors uh, that are almost um, uh, that have almost uh, neutral effects on weight, and then uh, insulin, sulfonylurea, and uh, thiazolidondions, which can even increase weight. So uh, when weight management is our goal, we can use these data and evidence. The newly approved drug trisopatide is not uh, shown in that network meta-analysis, and uh, it's not even available uh, here in Iran yet. Uh, it has dual GIP and GIP-1 receptor agonist and have, uh, can improve beta cell function and insulin sensitivity, uh, the three doses of 5, 10, and 15, and uh, a dose dependent superiority in weight reduction and lowering hemoglobin A1c uh, exists in this, for this uh, medication, tirzapatide. Here you can observe the dose dependent superiority in weight reduction when compared to uh, placebo and even GLP-1 receptor agonist, and uh, the dose dependent superiority in lowering hemoglobin A1C versus uh, all comparators uh, versus placebo, basal insulin, and GLP-1 receptor agonists. Therefore, if our goal is to uh, reduce the weight of the person with diabetes, Besides lifestyle, mod medical nutrition therapy, medication, and bariatric surgery if indicated, we should uh, use uh, the medications with uh, high efficacy for weight management uh, that uh, in, uh, they are uh, tirzapatide, then liraglutide, SGLT2 inhibitors, and uh, metformin DPP-4 inhibitors in order uh, of very high to uh, neutral effects. And uh, otherwise, if only glycemic management is our goal, we should use either metformin or uh, any other agent uh, considering the person characteristics and the efficacy, cost, and risk of hypoglycemia. And uh, in order of efficacy, uh, medications like tirzapatide, oral combination, GLP, the combination of GLP-1 receptor agonists and insulin are highly efficient. And uh, then other GLP-1 receptor agonists, metformin, SGLT2 inhibitors, sulfonin ura and thiazolidondions, and finally, DPP-4 inhibitor, which has uh, moderate efficacy in reducing blood glucose level. Thank you for your attention. Hey, thank you, Dr. Nikopainari, for your very thorough presentation on the recent advances in diabetes management. Uh, I had a few questions that I would like to ask. Uh, I was talking to Reza recently, and I was astonished on how much time he has to spend on just visiting a regular patient with diabetes. How much time do you use routinely in your clinic? And, you know, you have to check for a lot of complications, you have to check the blood glucose charts. Do you have any application which can help you? Or do you give a piece of paper to the patient and he just charts them down? 
usually endocrinologists, uh, when they are uh, working uh, in their private clinics, uh, they are not much interested in uh, visiting uh, persons with diabetes because we know that uh, it takes lots of time to assess uh, all the issues or the complications and to assess all the patient and uh, characteristics and the side effects. And uh, presently we have, um, for example, Tehran University of Medical Sciences, there are uh, um, two um, clinics, multidisciplinary clinics that in them, uh, primary healthcare and um, general uh, practitioners who have uh, uh, been experted, who have become experted and received education on management of diabetes uh, and known as diabetologists uh, now uh, visit their patients and uh, only complicated issues are discussed with an endocrinologist. Uh, and in, the, in these clinics, uh, there, um, there are persons who have been uh, uh, thoroughly inspect feet and uh, examine the, for feet ulcer and the uh, side effects of uh, and complications of diabetes. Um, therefore, we, uh, we know that a person with diabetes is someone who uh, takes a lot of time. And uh, for me, for example, in my clinic, when I visit a person with diabetes, uh, in that time, I can um, uh, it can take at least 20 minutes and uh, I'm not even uh, thoroughly examining the person and I refer him to um, diabetes clinics. Uh, for the devices, um, Usually persons uh, have also difficulty affording for uh, the strips and uh, I can um, really see that they are not, um, even when they are receiving basal and pandial insulin three times a day, uh, they are not uh, charting their blood glucose regularly and uh, they skip uh, uh, monitoring uh, at intervals, uh, which uh, can make uh, the management uh, difficult and the decision how to change the uh, insulin and um, uh, and um, even they when they observe their blood glucose levels are high they do not take any action and uh, they come after one year and say that uh, my blood glucose are uh, more than 200 300 uh, and um, uh, I asked a friend of mine who is a pediatric endocrinologist and said that uh, regarding the blood glucose meters, uh, there is uh, one uh, called FreeSense, uh, which can uh, provide us with data of a one week period and it provides chart of uh, how blood glucose are uh, monitored. Uh, and uh, the data can be used uh, remotely by telehealth and uh, if uh, patients are uh, motivated enough or they receive education, um, it can help manage diabetes better. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'm a gastroenterologist and I had a question regarding my own patients. Is it really necessary to discontinue the use of oral hypoglycemic agents in patients with cirrhosis, even if they're compensated cirrhosis? Or can we just continue the drugs in, in a, at a lower dose and closer follow-up? Uh, the safest thing to do is that uh, we, in those with uh, cirrhosis, uh, we usually uh, start insulin, ter uh, insulin therapy, and they uh, usually need uh, very uh, low doses uh, of uh, insulin. And uh, yes, um, it is preferred to use insulin. Okay. Uh, we do not have your voice. You, you are. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Nikopanoi. Thank you for your uh, very good presentation. Uh, let's go on to Reza. Uh, let me introduce him again. Dr. Reza Pishtad is an endocrinologist at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. He will be an assistant professor at Mass General Hospital at Harvard University in a couple of months. And he is a very good friend of mine. I had the privilege of uh, him in our residency program at Shiraz University of Medical Sciences about uh, I think 15 years ago, 12 years ago. And uh, Reza will, will be talking about the recent techn technological advances at, uh, and the state of the art technology, which is being used at a center at Johns Hopkins. So Reza, the screen is all yours. Well, thank you, Amir. Thank you for your kind introduction and your invitation. Uh, thank you also, Dr. Panayo, for your great introductory presentation. I think you already covered uh, some of my slides, so um, I'm going to be uh, moving uh, faster. Um, 
I'll be talking like 40, 45 minutes on the topic of recent technological and pharmacological advances in diabetes management. So I have nothing to disclose related to this presentation. Um, my outlines of my talk is to overview of most recently uh, FDA approved medications for treatment of diabetes. I'm going to quickly talk about the basics of continuous glucose monitoring devices, as well as insulin pump. And I, I hope I have time to spend more time in detail in these areas. So this picture uh, was interesting to me. I, I cited this picture from New England Journal of Medicine in 2012 which uh, shows, um, uh, uh, nicely shows the impact of diabetes treatment on patient's outcome. You see a young girl in 1920s, um, before the era of insulin discovery, and after treatment with insulin, how, um, I mean, her body shape and her quality of life changed. So that changed the diabetes management in like 100 years ago. So there have been major milestones in diabetes treatment. Like 100 years ago, Dr. Banting extracted insulin from pancreas of a dog and showed that the blood glucose will go down if you infuse the dogs with insulin. Two years later, Eli Lilly company started producing insulin and about 20, 30 years later, uh, sulfonylureas became available. And the term insulin dependent and insulin non-insulin dependent diabetes was first introduced in 1960s. The first glucometer was made in 1970s by uh, Ames Company in 1980s. The recombinant insulin came to market. Short rapid acting insulin Lispro was, came, um, uh, was available in 1996. And the atypical diabetes Modi, uh, uh, you're all aware of that was introduced in 1990s. And since 2000, we have the um, ability to do the islet cell transplantation. So there's, there has been an explosion of diabetes treatment options over the past 25 years. As you see, insulin was first discovered like 100 years ago, and there was nothing in the market um, for about 20 or 30 years. But as in 1990s, uh, uh, the um, metformin by guanides become available and these all, these all advances have been happening within the past 20 years. And um, basically uh, try to get more focus on GLP-1 and uh, Dr. Panel already covered SGL-2. I'm gonna be quicker on that. So um, there are two major landmark trials or major milestones in diabetes treatment, which I'm pretty sure you guys are all aware of those two um, big trials, CCCT and uh, UKPDS, which um, evaluated the type 1 diabetes patients in the CCT, and they showed the benefits of type glucose control, and their follow-up studies showed the legacy effect of type control. And therefore, UKPDS, uh, which was done on type 2 diabetic patients, type control of blood sugar levels, as well as blood pressure control, will reduce the risk of complications. So these two studies provided the rationale for aggressive treatment of diabetes. If you control your glucose, you will lower your diabetes complications and you have a better life, less and um, less mortality. So this is the uh, idea in 1990s, right? FDA at that time approved new drugs for treatment of diabetes on the basis of their safety and efficacy in lowering levels of hemoglobin A1C, which is used as a surrogate point for long-term diabetes complications. Because at that time, there was no cardiovascular outcomes um, required. However, in 2008, FDA issued a guidance for industry say, stating that no glucose-lowering drug will be approved for type 2 diabetes if they are associated with an acceptable level of cardiovascular risk in their post-marking trials and cardiovascular outcomes. And that led to discovery and more trials to be done on cardiovascular risk with the reduction, renal risk benefits, or heart failure management. So um, talking about GLP-1, xn 4 was the component of the saliva of this reptile, Gila monster, 
uh, with shared uh, um, homology with sequencing of uh, exenatide, which is the first um, uh, medication that was um, um, approved for human use. So GLP-1 is basically coming from the saliva of this reptile. There are multiple formulations of GLP-1 receptor agonists available. Dulaglutide is uh, sold here with the brand name of Trulicity. And um, already has shown cardiovascular risk reduction, stroke risk reduction in rewind trial is being used once weekly. The newer after that, semaglutide with the brand name of Ozempic uh, is also being used once weekly. And there is also an oral preparation of that medication with the name of Rebelsus. Um, um, the, the most recent one, Chirizapatide, which is um, a dual GLP-1 and GIP dual agonist, glucagon-like peptide one and glucose-dependent insulin tropic polypeptide, these are major um, increasing hormones derived from L cells of in intestine. And uh, that comes with the uh, brand name of Monjaro. And there are multiple formulations from 2.5 to 15 milligram. Typically what we do is start with 2.5 milligram weekly. And if the uh, patient is tolerating the medication without any side effects, we gradually every four weeks increase the dose to, to the maximum of 15 milligram. The way that this medication works is that increases and enhances glucose dependent insulin secretion, decreases glucagon secretion, and slows gastric emptying. It's a quite uh, effective medication with about uh, approximately 2% reduction um, in A1C level, and there is a low risk of hypoglycemia. The great feature of this medication um, is their impressive uh, effect on weight loss. And uh, this study, which was uh, published in the New England Journal of Medicine last year, um, showed the effect of once weekly uh, tears appetite as compared with placebo on body weight. On the left upper corner, you see um, the gray one is the uh, placebo effect, which was like 3%. And the full dose of tears appetite was 20%. That is quite impressive. And nowadays, there are some arguments that that can also compete with the effect of bariatric surgery. Um, so this is the graph that you see. This is the placebo effect on top, and the lower one shows the effect on weight. Um, so, um, but the, the important note is that this medication is currently being used for diabetes management in the U.S., and it's not yet covered by insurance companies for obesity. So now we're, we're prescribing this for diabetes management. In terms of uh, cardiovascular risk benefits and heart failure, renal benefits, they're under investigation. The results are not out yet. In the preliminary studies in SERPAS4, they have been, they have shown some cardiovascular risk benefits, just like GLP-1, other GLP-1 agonists. And um, there is no renal dosing needed for this medication in CKD patients. And uh, side effects are quite common, like GLP-1 agonists. So you have to uh, counsel your patients ahead of time about the side effects. Tell them about nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, constipation or diarrhea. And um, there is a question mark about cholecystitis and acute, acute pancreatitis. You should be more cautious in those patients, not contraindicated, but um, you should be more careful. There is an FDA black box warning for um, um, history of um, medullary thyroid cancer um, that was seen in animal studies. Of course, it's a new medication, it's costly and expensive. And um, important to note that if you want to start this medication, you got to stop DPP-4 inhibitors because they, they work in a similar way. And if the patient is concurrently on insulin, you should anticipate lowering the dose of insulin, especially the prandial insulin, to minimize or avoid the risk of hypoglycemia. So older guidelines on diabetes management were mostly focused on glucose reduction. They were glucocentric and on the lowering of A1C, which is a surrogate endpoint for long-term diabetes complications uh, were the rule. Um, but um, 
there is a uh, there is a big change in the recent guidelines that Dr. Panay uh, showed in um, in her presentation. Our overall approach is nowadays the medications are selected with a focus on the potential additional benefits on underlying comorbidities, particularly for cardiovascular disease, heart failure, or CKD. For example, if a patient has CKD, right. Uh, meaning GFR, low GFR albumin urea, you would choose a medication like SGL2 with proven uh, CKD progression benefit or GLP-1 receptor agonist with proven benefit. And if you're not able to achieve your target A1C, then at the next step, you will add the other medication or replace it. Uh, the same is true for cardiovascular risk reduction. Uh, you use either of these two medications and if your A1C is still above the target, you will replace it or add another medication. Or if there is any contraindication or side effects, you will definitely replace that. For heart failure with either preserved ejection fraction or reduced ejection fraction, HGL2 inhibitors with proven heart failure benefits are the uh, treatment of choice. All right, so let's um, shift gears and move on to uh, the diabetes technology. So um, about glucose testing, um, I found this um, uh, interesting picture about the evolution of glucose testing. Here on the uh, upper uh, left of the uh, picture, you see um, like 600 years ago, ago before Christ, uh, the ants um, were actually uh, used to determine if there is any glucose in the urine. And 100 years later, people tend to taste the urine. And if they taste um, sweetie, then they will say, oh, this patient has uh, diabetes. And in 1940s, the first um, tablets, um, which um, will add it to the urine and color would change, were introduced to the market. And in 1940s and 1950s, the first uh, urine dipsticks came to the market. And in 1970s, um, the first glucometer was invented. And during 1980s to 2000, there is an evolution and a growth in technology for glucose testing. And um, nowadays, um, we are using uh, more and more uh, continuous glucose monitoring devices. So continuous glucose monitoring device or CGM briefly, um, here is a picture that you see there's a sensor on the skin of this patient and there's a receiver um, which for this patient is uh, his iPhone or Android uh, uh, phone which can be used as a receiver. So what patients can typically do, go to the app store or, or, or uh, Android to download the application or the app which is compatible with this um, um, corresponding continuous glucose monitoring, and they can use their phone as a receiver to, to see the data. So what is continuous glucose monitoring? Uh, what is CGM? So CGM is basically a small device that um, uh, works by inserting a tiny uh, wire under the skin, and it's fixated on the skin, um, and the, this wire is like one or two centimeters in, um, long, and the patient basically do not feel it. Um, and there is a transmitter which attaches to the uh, to this device, and that um, sends and communicates the real time uh, data to the iCloud or via Bluetooth or the receiver of the patient. So the patient can see the data on the cloud. So other members of the family may be able to see the patient's data. For example, if it's a child, the parents can also see because it will share the data into the iCloud. And then the patient can see it on, um, on the cell phone. So how they work is that uh, that's a small sensor that is going to be placed under skin, typically on a subcutaneous tissue. And that tends to measure the interstitial glucose levels uh, in intervals of one to five minutes. So that provides a more comprehensive assessment of glycemic control. And patients can see any glucose excursions using this glucose um, trend arrows, and they can uh, decide about the treatment options. Um, nowadays, CGM devices are becoming easier to use in the United States, more accurate and more accessible to our patients. 
Um, uh, it's important to note that um, because we are measuring the interstitial fluid glucose, not blood glucose, there is a, uh, there is a delay between um, the measurements when you uh, the patients actually see the numbers on their receiver and their actual blood glucose. And the other point about these devices is that if you compare them with a, a glucometer, there might be a difference between 15 to 25 milligram per deciliter between these devices. So they're not quite similar. Um, and the other important point is that during exercise or during the time where, it, where there is active uh, change in blood glucose, these differences is more pronounced because blood glucose is actively being sucked up by the fat cells and um, muscle cells. Um, so what is the difference between a glucometer and a continuous glucose monitor? So in contrast to finger sticks, which is one time, and um, the, uh, the CGM measures glucose from interstitial fluids, right? but you use your glucometer to check your capillary blood, uh, blood glucose. And uh, because there, there should be um, a balance between the blood and interstitial fluid glucose, there is a lag time of 15 minutes between the blood glucose and the sensor value that you see. And this difference is more pronounced when the patient uh, um, blood glucose is in motion due to food or uh, in taking more food or they're doing some exercise or they're recovering from hypoglycemia. And that's very important because sometimes patients see the low numbers and they panic and they try to eat something and they said, oh, my blood glucose is not improving. Let's eat more and more. And all of a sudden after 20 minutes, the blood glucose spikes and rose to like 300s, 400s. So we should give your patient reassurance, don't panic, just take a small amount of carbohydrates and wait for a couple of minutes so that your um, machine calibrates with the new numbers. Um, the other thing is uh, one might ask, what is uh, a difference between uh, glycate hemoglobin, hemoglobin A1C, and uh, why don't you use A1C instead of um, continuous glucose monitoring. Well, of course, there are some goods uh, or pros about um, measuring A1C, um, like this is very easy to perform, widely available everywhere. Nowadays, it's very inexpensive, very cheap, and standardized among different labs or across the labs. But there are certainly some disadvantages and cons uh, about this A1C, right? Because it's only an average of your blood glucose. So if your patient has a blood glucose of 400 at one time and then has blood glucose of 50, then the A1C will show you the average of that, which is like 200. But at, in reality, your patient had a blood glucose of 40 and had a blood glucose of 50. So you cannot see this variability in blood glucose uh, when you're measuring A1C. And because you are not seeing the timing or changing in your blood glucose, you're not able to adjust the insulin dosage um, um, precisely, right? And you, 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 you cannot see or you cannot predict in what directions the blood glucose is going uh, for your patient. And of course, the uh, A1C is inaccurate in many situations, right? There are implications of using A1C for uh, diagnosing diabetes, as you guys know better than me, that there are certain conditions like uh, iron deficiency anemia, hemolytic anemias, some sort of hemoglobinopathies or um, vitamins, um, excessive ingestion of vitamins. They can all affect um, your A1C. So A1C could not be uh, accurate in those settings. Um, so what options are available for continuous glucose monitoring devices? Like look at it as a car. We have different cars, car brands, right? Toyota, Pride, or whatever. So the same thing for um, the kind of CGMs in the United States, but they're not that much different from each other. Medtronic Guardian is the oldest one in the market, um, came in in like 1980s, and then Freestyle Libre and Dexcom G6 uh, came to the market. 
this is the receiver of these uh, devices um, and these three, and this is the uh, sensors. So uh, freestyle sensor, Medtronic Guardian sensor, and Dexcom G6 sensors. So it's important to know that these sensors are not permanent. So you have to replace these sensors every 10 to 14 days, depending on, on the brand. For example, for Libre, which there's a picture of this here, this is the receiver, this is the sensor that you place it on the skin, and this is the applicator that the patients use it to uh, actually fix the sensor on, on, on the arm or on the thigh, on the on their belly or whatever, wherever. And um, this is the um, sensor and this is the wire that goes to the subcutaneous fat. And this is another brand, which is called Dexcom uh, G6. Uh, again, this is the receiver. This is the patient's phone, or you can have the separate receiver, but you don't need to carry two, two, um, two devices. You can simply use your uh, phone or iPhone just work as a receiver. This is the applicator uh, which inserts the sensor under the skin and the sensor gets glucose information. Uh, this is a sensor which uh, uses the wireless system, Bluetooth system to sense the data to the display uh, device. This is a display device. And uh, display device um, shows the glucose information and provides alarms and alerts. That's a good thing, a feature of a continuous glucose monitoring. So your patients can set an alarm on their um, devices, on their phone, and telling, hey, if my blood glucose uh, rises to more than one, for example, 250, just send me an alarm. And if my blood glucose drops to less than 70 or 80, just send another alarm. So that, that this patient will be aware of um, hypoglycemia. Uh, of note, the sensor, for example, this one, uh, the sensor for Dexcom has to be replaced for every 10 days. Um, but the previous one, Libre, could be changed every 14 days. One of the great features about Dexcom or other, even Freestyle Libre, all of them, is trend arrows. So trend arrows shows the speed and direction of your blood glucose. So basically, uh, what that means is that if um, if the, um, the the prediction in the blood glucose within the next half an hour is between zero to thirty milligrams per deciliter. The, 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 the CGM finds it as a constant blood sugar. So it says it's maintaining your blood sugars. That's why the arrow is horizontal. But if your blood sugar is slowly rising, meaning that 30 to 60 millimeter per deciliters in, in the, in the uh, next half an hour, that shows you this oblique arrow toward upwards. And if there's a more severe hyperglycemia, this is vertical one, which is 60 to 90. And if there is a severe or very uh, drastic increase in your blood sugar, predicted blood sugar in half an hour, that, that, that this double arrow will, will be shown on your, um, on your cell phone. On the other hand, if your blood sugar is dropping, you're slowly falling your blood sugar 30 to 60 millimeters, in half an hour, there is an oblique and downward um, arrow. And if it's more severe, 60 to 90 vertical one, and more and more severe than rapidly falling, that would be 90 or more, um, that shows you. So this is very helpful for the patient because the patient can see what directions are their blood glucose going. Um, so this is, the, uh, if you download a, uh, uh, um, a deck, um, CGM data uh, on a paper that is called ambulatory glucose profile, or we simply say AGP. So ambulatory glucose profile. Um, so there are two main areas that you have to look at. One is time in range, and the other one is glucose statics and targets. So, uh, um, so let's just start from here. For example, this patient has. Uh, worn this CGM from December 7 to December 20. 
So he wore it for 14 days. So um, it means, sorry, he, he, this is showing the data for 14 days. It doesn't necessarily mean the patient wore it for 14 days. This is the data for 14 days. Um, and you can change it. You can change it to 30 days. You can change it to 90 days. And basically what we typically do is we, we check the past 14 days of the patient, which is the most recent one. And the time the CGM is active is 97%, meaning that 97% of the time the patient used the CGM and used it on the body and was active. Then there is a table here that shows you uh, the percentage of the time that the, the patient uh, spent in different categories like in 70 to 180, more than 180, less than 70, less than 54. So there are, there are, and there are certain numbers that they put on the table, which I'm gonna go over with you shortly. And average glucose is just, just the mean of the blood glucose the patient had within the past 14 days, it's 141. And there are other two metrics here um, that um, uh, they are quite important glucose management indicator and glucose variability. So basically CGM provides a different estimate of average blood glucose than A1C. Um, and this GMI that's here is calculated from a formula which is derived from mean CGM number. And there's a formula that the pump, uh, the CGM calculates that, and it gives you a number which kind of, which should be similar, could, should be similar to your A1C level. So we use this number as a surrogate for A1C level, but there might be some differences in A1C depending on if the patient has anemia or renal failure or other conditions, A1C is not that accurate. So we rely on this more number more than A1C. And uh, the coefficients of variation uh, is glucose variability. It shows at how, uh, how much the patient's blood sugar oscillates. So if the patient's blood sugar goes up and down, up and down, this is a big change. This is a high variability. And we don't want that. This is not a good thing. So the, the lower the glucose variability is, is the better the patient's blood glucose control. Typically, we want this number to be less than 33% of the time. And on the right side is the time in range. The time in range per consensus guidelines, this is um, um, the percentage of the time that the patient's sensor glucose values are measured within pre-specified ranges. The pre-specified ranges per guidelines is 70 to 180. And that has to be above more than 70% of the, of the time. And 70% of the time is close to 17 hours in 24 hour. And for high blood sugar, it should be less than 25% of the time, which is shown here in yellow and orange. So that has to be less than 25% of the time. High means any value above 180 and very high defines as blood glucose more than 250, 250. And low blood glucose is any values less than 70 and um, with, the, with this one and very low is less than uh, 54. So ideally this low and very low should be less than 5% of the time and something like 15 minutes in 24 hours. So um, uh, this is uh, basically the AGP ambulatory glucose profile. So, um, like A1C that we customize or individualize uh, A1C for different patients. Uh, we also um, um, personalize glycemic targets for our patients. Here, for example, on the right side, this is a pregnant patient, quite healthy, gestational diabetes and has a baby. So you wanna protect the baby, you wanna make sure that uh, she has a very tight blood glucose control. That's why you see the green column is very uh, tall here. So it's more than 90% of the time that the blood glucose should be on this range. In contrast, for this patient, for example, uh, who is an old diabetic patient with multiple comorbidities and very um, uh, complicated patients, low life expectancy, you don't need to strictly control um, blood glucose. Even if you control the blood glucose 50% of the time, um, that's enough. 
for our patients. So um, that's 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 uh, that's that's the way that you can personalize glycemic targets in your patients. So GMI and coefficient of variation, I already spoke about that. So GMI can be close to A1C, but um, sometimes there's discrepancy. And if there's discrepancy, rely on this number rather than A1C. And coefficient of variation is uh, how much difference up and downs the patient will have on their blood sugar. So this is the, for example, Dexcom overview for a 14 day period. Here is um, uh, 14 days. So it's midnight and this is midnight and the middle of them is the at noon time. So as you see, most of the time, this patient has been in the range of 70 to 180, which is very ideal for our patients. So we want it to be in this range. And if you see at the column for targeting range, this patient 85% of the time was in range. And our, our goal is to be more than 70%. 70 so he's already exceeding 70%. So he's doing great. And he doesn't have too many low blood sugars, so 1% of the time. The ideal it should be less than 5%. And the highs should be less than 25, which is already here, 25. That's why the GMI for this patient or surrogate for A1C is 6.7%. And uh, standard deviation, which kind of um, um, corresponds to coefficient um, of variation is 37 milligram per deciliter. And the average blood glucose is 141. And this patient uses sensor for 93%. So that's a good, very, that's a very good patient that we have here. So uh, it's worth noting that TIR time in range of 70% generally corresponds to A1C level of 7%. So each incremental 5% increase in time in range is associated with clinically significant benefits for individuals with type 1 DM or type 2 diabetes. So this is an AGM report um, uh, for another patient. And this is the percentile, upper 10 percentile, lower 10, 10 percentile. And this is the median or 50 percentile of the time. And this little box shows individual separate days and as you see, this patient, for example, starts the nighttime with this red one, which is low blood sugars, and then goes up after breakfast, and then goes down, and then goes up. So the yellow is highs, and the uh, reds are lows. So this is not a good patient. You see ups and downs, ups and downs. So this is a yo-yo pattern. So we don't want this. So this is not a good patient. Um, and as you see, this timing range is 47%. So this is an example of a patient who is not under good control of blood glucose management. So CGM reports elements that uh, we use, standards of CGM metrics. Uh, these are the uh, metrics that when you download the data from CGM, that provides to you. It shows you in the number of days the patient used that, the percentage of the time the patient um, used um, the CGM, what is the mean glucose um, and GMI we talked about, time above the range, time below the range, time in the range, time um, for hypoglycemia. You can see all these metrics when you download the CGM data. And this is the future um, of CGM. This is on the horizon in the pipeline. This ever since pump is not approved yet, it's under investigation, but will be, I think, I hope will be approved um, soon in the future. That's an implantable uh, sensor and they, the patients put it on their arms and they can keep it for six months. Previous sensors that I told you, they have to remove it every 10 and 14 days, so they have to change it. But this one is a waterproof one, so um, they can go with for swimming for that. and. Uh, it's very cool. I mean, they, they wear it for six months uh, without any changing on that. So who benefits from CGM? Um, in the future, they will say everyone with diabetes, but nowadays, uh, definitely, particularly patients who have nocturnal hypoglycemia or hypoglycemia awareness, because the good feature is that you will see the trend arrows and you will see the alarms will go off and will... Um, uh, notify the patients of their low blood sugars and the patients who have frequent episodes of hypoglycemia. They are the major groups that benefit from CGMs. And 
Now the SCGM is now considered a therapeutic intervention. They're linked with uh, pumps. I will talk shortly about them. So I think in the future, they are more commonly used in our practice. I mean, nowadays, for any patient that um, who uses checks their blood sugar more than twice a day, I, I prescribe CGM, and I hope that their insurance will cover that. Uh, quite interestingly, during um, COVID pandemic, we were able to use CGM uh, as inpatient. As you know, CGMs are not FDA approved for inpatient use. They are not standardized for inpatient. But during COVID pandemic, to, um, to minimize the risk of nursing staff to patients with uh, COVID, we use um, um, CGMs in the hospital. And there are multiple studies coming out soon to see the efficacy or the accuracy of these devices as inpatient as well. So in summary, CGM provides real-time uh, education and immediate intervention to reduce hypoglycemia and hyperglycemia and increase time in range for your patients and results in reduction of your A1C. Therefore, it reduces your complications of diabetes and you can use it in both type 1 and type 2 diabetes in high-risk patients. And uh, it can be paired with insulin pump and shows you the uh, timing range and the different metrics. And there are expanding coverage to allow, allow access for patients with diabetes. And um, um, inpatient use of CGM is on the horizon and we'll have it soon. All right, so the last part of my talk would, uh, will be about insulin pump. Here you see in this picture um, on the left side, you, there is a, pop, a pump pot. And on the right side, this is a continuous glucose monitoring device on the, uh, on the abdomen. These devices are uh, communicating and they're talking with each other. And they also talk with the cell phone, um, which is a receiver. Uh, via Bluetooth system, wireless system. Of note, for example, this is a specific type of pump, Omnipod 5 pump, the pod needs to be changed every two or three days. So they're not permanent, this one specifically. Who is a uh, successful candidate for pump? Any patient who is actively involved in their diabetes care, meaning that they measure the blood glucose multiple times a day uh, with their finger sticks, and um, they're able to count carbohydrates of the food, and they should be able to communicate with their diabetes educator and diabetes team to tell them about their care. Those have to be there in order to um, consider pump prescription. Here you see the insulin pump elements. Here is the controller. This is the digital display insulin pump. There are some buttons on it, and there is a tubing. This, this pump is, uh, is with wire, but we have wireless pumps as well. So there's a flexible tubing here, and there is an um, infusion set, which is connected to, to the cannula here. So th this is the magnified uh, picture of the cannula on top uh, left corner. Uh, this is the tubing. This is the infusion set. This is the cannula, and that is placed in subcutaneous issue in skin and fat. And basically this pump holds and measure amount of a rapid acting insulin. So you fill the pump with rapid, uh, rapid acting insulin in reservoir and the pump releases a set amount of insulin, which we call it the base of dose, continuously and constantly throughout the day and night. And the, the user, the patient, whenever the patient wants to eat something, tells the pump to release a surge of insulin which we call it a bolus insulin, just before meals. Typically we tell the patients to bolus the insulin 15 minutes before they, um, they start eating because it takes 15 minutes for the insulin to be reabsorbed and to kick, to kick in. So that's why we tell um, to bolus their insulin 15 or 20 minutes before they start eating their food. And, and the amount that the, the patient should bolus is that the patient will tell the pump, okay, pump, I'm going to eat like 20 grams of carbohydrates. And the pump through the algorithms and the um, settings that you already gave the pump will calculate the dose of the insulin that needs to be delivered based on, on the amount of carbohydrates in the food, uh, based on um, 
the current blood glucose, if the patient's blood glucose is already high, so the pump would go and deliver more insulin. If the blood sugar is low, the, the pump would deliver less insulin. This subtracts the amount of insulin that it was supposed to deliver. And there is a uh, term insulin on board, meaning that when you inject insulin with the pump, there might be still some insulin in your system. So the pump will recognize that uh, with their algorithms. And the, the, if there is already some insulin in your body, that will subtract the insulin that needs to be delivered to avoid insulin stacking and precipitating hypoglycemia. And of course, um, the, the user, the patient can change the, um, and you can override the pump. So if you think the pump is not giving you enough insulin, you can override the pump, but the pump would give you some caution that, um, are you sure you wanna override me? You are at risk of hypoglycemia. And if you override that, the pump will listen to you. So it's not locked there. And, and you can change it for different situation. So the elements of the insulin pump is multiple things. You will see the average glucose on pump download, timing range. If you have hypo or hyperglycemia, this is kind of, kind of similar to um, um, CGM data. And uh, you can uh, mo uh, modify, adjust the insulin delivery settings, right? You can put the basal rate, uh, how much based on rate you want to give the pump, carb ratios, how much insulin to metabolize your carbohydrates, correction factor, meaning if your blood sugar is high, how much insulin should I tell the pump to, to deliver to correct the high blood sugars. And you can adjust the glucose targets. So most of the pumps, they give you option to customize the targets for between 110 to 150. Um, and the insulin action, which is insulin on board, typically is three to five hours because the, the, the half-life of this uh, long-acting insulin is four hours. So typically we, we set it to three to five hours. And you can see that data view, just like CGM, a two-week summary view, you will see the logbook view, daily view, and uh, you, you will see all of those. And the other thing uh, that you can see is how much your patient is adherent to using the pump. Are they putting the carbohydrates in the pump correctly? Do they bolus uh, correctly? Are they um, actually using in the changing infusion set changes? Because infusion set, the, the tubing has to be changed every three days because there will be clogged or kinked. So they have to be changed and the pump will record that and tell you if you were doing that. And if there is low blood sugars, the pump will suspend the blood sugar, uh, the, uh, the basal insulin. That will be also seen as pump sub suspensions. And total daily insulin, percentile of pay, uh, basal and bolus insulin, they will be all displayed in the dashboard. So the automated uh, insulin delivery is a way of delivering insulin through an insulin pump that communicates with a continuous glucose monitoring. That's why we call it closed loop system, hybrid closed loop system. So it mimics an artificial pancreas. So we are getting close to artificial pancreas, but we are not yet there completely. Why? Because still you have to have your patient put the amount of carbohydrates with each food into the pump. They still need to do that. But if their blood sugar is going up and the, the pump would deliver an automatic correction bolus, if the sensor glucose is predicted to be above, for example, 160, so the um, basal rate will go up gradually. And if your blood sugar is very high, anything above 180, the pump will go ahead and give you a bolus insulin, larger dose of insulin. And of course, if your blood sugar is at goal, well, they, that maintains the, uh, the basal insulin delivery. And um, in contrast, on, in, in up, um, in on the other hand, if your blood sugars decrease, this decreases basal insulin delivery if sensor glucose is predicted to be lower than 110. And if you're developing hypoglycemia and your blood sugar is less than 70, the pump will suspend any insulin delivery and they will let you know. That's very interesting hybrid closed loop system, which is the, the system that the tandem pump, this is the name of the tandem, tandem is the company of this 
pump with with T. Um, this source control IQ. So the control IQ is this hybrid clo closed loop system that this specific pump uses with this Dexcom continuous glucose monitoring devices. There are other cool features of the pump, like sleep mode and exercise mode. For example, if the patient is going to sleep, uh, they don't need to give their, their, their themselves additional insulin, but the pump will more strictly control the blood glucose so that uh, the glucose range will be narrower because you want to keep the insulin at the time of the sleep in a very steady state situation. And, and when you're doing exercise mode, when you're more active, you need less insulin and you are at high risk of hypoglycemia. That's why the pump actually relaxes the target. So the targets would be 140 to 160 because you are doing exercise, and you are using uh, the, um, the muscle cells are using the glucose constantly, and you are at higher risk of hypoglycemia. You, you should know that you should turn on and turn off this mode. So if you go to sleep, you turn on the sleep mode. When you wake up, you turn off. And the same thing for exercise mode. On the horizon and the future, there is a, a pump coming up. The name is Beta, Bio, Beta Bionics Ilex. And that incorporates both insulin and glucagon. So there are two cartridges. One, you, you can put the insulin on, and the other one, you can put glucagon. So if the patients develop hypoglycemia with this uh, insulin pump, then uh, the pump will uh, inject glucagon. And the last is the smart insulin pens, which is used for MDI. So this is not... Um, uh, this is not... Um, an insulin pump, this is a smart pen, and that smart pen uh, just connects with your device and you can tell your device uh, to, um, to adjust the insulin which is ne needs to be delivered by this pump. And this is just a pump, it's a pen, but it's a smart pen. And it, it communicates with your cell phone and tells you how much insulin is on board. Um, there are some um, uh, contraindications with using a pump if your patients uh, are not, mentally or physically able to operate the pump, for example, after anesthesiology, recovering from uh, major surgery, uh, they are not uh, alert or yet, they should not use pump for DKHHS, they should not use that. If the patient is suicidal or they are not a good patient, they are not following with their physicians, they refuse to take care, they, these pumps should not be used. And there are certainly red flags. If your patient is not checking blood glucose multiple days at time of the day, and they're not following with their um, um, diabetes educator, they're not doing pump carbs because they have to put the um, carbohydrate content into the pump so that the pump knows how much to deliver insulin. Uh, these are the red flags that um, you might talk to your patients and you might consider removing the pump from them. And there are, there, there are sometimes disruptions with the pump. Patients call us, my pump is not working. My blood sugar is constantly going up after a few hours. What we typically tell them is just change the site of the pump insertion, to change the infusion setting, making sure that the tubing is not kinked or clogged. So if they do all the things, they check the reservoir, the reservoir is not empty. If they all do all of this and still the blood glucose is high, then we have to remove the pump and put uh, insulin regimen. We will just transition them to sub Q insulin because otherwise the patient will end up being in decay. And um, you should be aware that uh, these uh, devices should not be used when the patients will undergo X-ray or CT. They should be temporarily removed and keep it outside of the X-ray room. And if uh, you anticipate that the pump will be disconnected more than one hour, you should still consider um, giving your patient insulin. Um, so new approaches, um, so done newer insulin also on the markets. We have uh, um, concentrated insulins, U500, and, uh, which is five times more concentrated insulin, U300, U200. We have ultra-rapid ultra acting insulin available, which works five minutes. We call it FIASP here in the United States. Uh, we have inhaled insulin nowadays. And the insulins that combines with GLP-1 receptor agonists, 
These are all newer instruments that are available. So this is my last slide. As a summary, uh, we have like 12 or 13, if you consider Tirzepatide, GLP-1, GIP as a separate class, individual drug classes, which are not available to lower your glu glucose in type 2 diabetes. It's important to determine the optimal A1C target for each patient first. Then medications are selected with a focus based on the underlying comorbidities. If the patients have a CVD, uh, heart failure or CKD, and then sequentially after metformin is added, you will um, use um, the other medications like uh, other classes. And if your patients are more than uh, on more than three types of uh, medications, at that time you probably consider insulin as the next step. And uh, now, as of now, metformin is still considered to, to be the first line of treatment because it's widely available, wide extensively uh, experienced with that medication. But with this um, evolution of these newer medications, there might, might, there might be a change in um, future guidelines and the dethronized metformin as the first um, um, option for uh, treatment of diabetes. Of course, you should not forget about the cardiovascular risk reduction. Um, you should take care of blood pressure, lipids, antiplatelet therapy. These are also important in reducing the um, cardiovascular risk in your um, patients and improve their outcome. All right, so uh, thank you for your uh, attention. I hope this has been helpful. I'm not sure, I'm, I, I hope I was not too fast. I wish I had more time to go in more details, but I'm at least glad to finish all my slides. Uh, this time I'm happy to stop here and take any questions. Okay, thank you Reza for your excellent presentation. I know it's past midnight there in Baltimore, so thank <laughs> you again for giving me your time. Um, you talked about the future of glucose monitoring, and you talked about CGM and artificial pancreas, but you know, pharmaceutical companies are producing new drugs and medications, and they're targeting different pathways. What do you think will be the real future in uh, blood glucose monitoring? Do you think there will be a role for personalized medicine, for stem cells, for gene therapy, or will we just go on to making new drugs and using them, or... Do you think that the real insulin pumps and CGM will replace what we are doing now at the present? Because I think that uh, CGM is used in only a few centers in the US and it's not really uh, globalized. Um, yes, that's, that's true. So the issue that we have, um, I mean, the institutions that I've been working with, the patients have good insurance. So I didn't have the issue with prescribing CGMs, but of course it's not available. Uh, globally, um, I think what will happen in the future is more companies are going to produce these um, devices and there will be more competition between them, among them, and they'll have to reduce the cost. So after this competition, they, when they reduce the cost and uh, there is a better coverage for insurance, so more people will finally get these CGM continuous glucose monitoring devices in the future. I think that will happen. Um, and, you know, this is more helpful for patients who require um, multiple blood sugar management throughout the day because they are, for example, using uh, insulin. When you're using insulin, you, you might drop bottom out, you might go low and you might go up. So CGM is more helpful for type one and type two patients who are on insulin. And if you have a patient who is only taking metformin once a day and the A1C is six, 7%, why would you need, uh, I mean, uh, CGM, the blood glucose is always flat and you don't need that. So the, the more advanced your diabetic patient is, the more need for CGM. Regarding treatment about insulin pump, transplant or uh, artificial pancreas, so um, this uh, technology is evolving toward uh, making um, not a hybrid closed loop system, but a full closed loop system, which uh, we hope that 
we don't even need to put carbohydrates uh, content in the pump. And we just place a device on our body and they take care of everything, just like our pancreas. This is the hope, and this is what this is on uh, under active research and under development right now. Um, uh, stem cell, um, I mean, they are working on it like uh, every other organs, like other organs, like um, heart or lung or liver. I think this is on the same stage. Um, here at Hopkins, um, when we have a patient with chronic pancreatitis, it's kind of related to your area. So if they have a severe pain and they get pancreatectomy uh, for pain management, what we do is that there is a robot that we have um, in, at our center. That robot extracts the beta cells from the pancreas before you get the pancreas out. And that um, beta cells will be in, um, actually uh, re reintroduced into our body through inferior vena cava, and that will implant on the liver or in the peritoneal area. So the, the, the machine, the robot will actually um, inject the uh, beta cells into your body again. And then the patients do not need they don't need to be insulin dependent because you are taking out the pancreas, but you are preserving the beta cells. That's a very nice thing that we see. We call it islet cell transplantation at Hopkins, and there are different groups are working on that. This is also um, currently available that I'm aware of, but I think um, the medications, these newer medication will become more widely available for type two diabetes patients and um, those insulin pumps or artificial pancreas would be more beneficial for patients who are insulin dependent maybe, um, like type one or advanced type two patients. Okay, thank you very much. Um, at the end, I would also like to thank the Appraise to Race team at Tehran University of Medical Sciences in the International Affairs Department. They have put a lot of time and effort in helping us prepare our poster and advertising and uh, helping us to just conduct this Zoom meeting. And thank you, Dr. Neku Panay. Thank you, Dr. Reza Pishad, for your time. And I hope to see you in the future in our next series of the webinar of How I Treat Diabetes. Thank you thank very you. much. It was really such a pleasure to be here. And I hope we can see each other and see each other more in the future through these uh, uh, virtual platforms. Thank you for arranging this meeting. Thank you. Thank, thank you very you. much. Uh, and thank you to the audience and Dr. Pishtar and Dr. Anushirvani for this uh, great webinar. Thank you. Good day. Good night to you, Reza. Thank you, everyone.